Hi everyone, thanks so much for being here. Uh, it sounds like you were just at a modules talk, so I'm happy that you're here for more modules, it's great. Um, so as he said, my name is Katie Hockman. Uh, I'm a software engineer on the Go team in um, New York City at Google. Uh, and I'm a part of the group of people who've been working on the Go module mirror and the checksum database. So in the previous talk, when you saw like proxy.golang.org, that's what my team has been working on. So I'm here to talk about some new things that are happening around package management and authentication in Go help you understand how these things work at a little bit more of a tangible level. So one thing you should know about me is that I absolutely adore dogs. And being a Go developer, I've decided that I want to create a set of Go packages that help people be better dog owners, because if dogs are happy, then I'm happy. So I create a new repository on GitHub, and I start creating the Go packages for all the source code that I want to provide. I make a package that can algorithmically determine the best dog walking route in your neighborhood. I make another package that can tell you what your dog is thinking based solely on the sound of their bark. And I make one more package that reminds you to buy a new dog toy every week so your dog never gets bored. But there's a lot of APIs that I'm going to need in order to make this code work. I need dependencies for storage, for audio processing, and for maps. But I have a few concerns. Firstly, I'm worried that I'm going to have challenges with non-reproducible builds. I am relying on a brand new endpoint on the Maps service that I'm using. If people import my package and they're using an old version of Maps, then things are going to break for them. I have no way of guaranteeing that their builds will be consistent with mine. Maybe the owner of the audio detection package that I'm depending on just gets fed up with managing it and just removes it from GitHub overnight. Now all of my code is broken, so is everyone else's who's using my package, and I'm really stuck. Even worse, there's a cat person out there who's trying to do me harm. And they've hacked the origin server that hosts some of the source code that I'm depending on. All of a sudden, I'm receiving the wrong code. My packages are no longer working reliably, and this malicious code that I got might be really dangerous. And by the time I realize what's going on, it's probably too late. So there are a few things that I might consider here in order to protect myself and those who depend on my code. Maybe I'll just stop having dependencies altogether. I'm just going to write everything from scratch, but that's not going to really work. You know, I can't reproduce some of the APIs that I want to use, and the quality of my code is going to suffer as a result. I could just vendor all of my dependencies, but that's going to inflate the size of my repository, and I'm worried that it's going to be difficult to maintain and update over time. Or maybe I just decide to do nothing at all. I just trust the, things, the state of things as they are today. I trust that my dependencies won't disappear, the GitHub and other code hosting sites will always be up and always give me what I'm asking for. But honestly, that's more trust that I'm comfortable with. So I do have some options, but none of them that solve all of my problems without creating new problems and risks of their own. So let's explore some better solutions that have popped up recently within Go. Modules can help us with our reproducible build problem. Module mirrors can help to eliminate the risk of disappearing dependencies. And a checksum database can help to eliminate the risk of getting the wrong code, making sure that every Go developer in the world gets the same source code every time they ask for it. So these three things, modules, mirrors, and the checksum database, are what I'm going to be talking about. So let's start with modules. A module is a version set of Go packages that relate to one another in some meaningful way. So in this example, I have my repository, github.com slash katiehockman slash puppies. And in this repo, I have a few Go packages. I have package walk, package bark, and package toys. And these packages share a lot of the same dependencies. So I put them in a single module that can now be versioned together. And a module's version has a major, minor, and patch component that make up its semantic version. So if you wanted to import a package before the existence of modules, you either had to vendor that source code if you wanted a specific commit, or you just had to rely on the latest version, which might be changing from day to day. So now, Packages can sit inside of a module that's a version snapshot in time to uniquely identify for everyone. And the contents of that module version are never allowed to change. They're immutable. Every new commit to this major version of the module also has to be backwards compatible with old ones. So for something to be a module, it only needs one thing, and that's a go.mod file that's sitting at its root directory. And a go mod file looks something like this. It specifies the minimum version of all the packages that your module uses. It's the only file that you should need to look at in order to figure out which direct dependencies that your module has. So here you can see some semantic versions like 1.4.1 and 
as well as some pseudo versions like v.o.o with a timestamp and a commit hash, which is helpful if you either want to depend on a specific commit or if the repository doesn't yet have any version tags. So by specifying that your code relies on version 1.4.1, then you guarantee that everyone who imports your package will never be allowed to use a version older than 1.4.1 with your code. And it does this, the Go command does this by doing something called minimal version selection to build a module based on the version specified in a go.mod file. So let's look as a basic example here. Let's say we have module A and B, which my module depends on. So each of these modules relies on C, but at a different version. So A requires at least version 1.5, and B requires at least version 1.6. And C has also published a newer version, 1.7. So if my module is relying on A and B, the Go command needs to choose the minimum possible version that satisfies the constraints of A and B's go.mod file when it's doing a build. So in this case, that's going to be version 1.6. So this minimal version selection guarantees reproducible builds because the Go command is using the oldest allowed version of each dependency in the build instead of a new version which may change from day to day. So now we have consistent reproducible builds that are no longer contingent on the latest commit history of a dependency. So one problem down, two to go. We've solved the problem of reproducible builds. Next, let's talk about how we can be sure that our dependencies won't disappear. So now that we have a version module that's never allowed to change, we have new opportunities for caching and for authentication that non-module mode didn't have. And this is where module proxies come in. This is what the flow looks like without a proxy. A Go developer runs a Go command like go get, and the Go command hits the origin server directly every single time the package isn't in the user's local cache. And by origin server here, we're referring to any place that holds Go source code, like GitHub, for example. And go get changes behavior depending on whether or not the Go command is running in modulaware mode or if it's running in Go path mode. But proxies are only used in modular mode, so that's the behavior that we're going to be discussing. So GoGet has a few jobs that we're going to talk about. It has to go out and actually get the code that you're asking for. But it also needs to understand new dependencies for your module based on the code that it just fetched. It has to resolve those dependencies, and it may need to update your go.mod file. But without a proxy, this can get really expensive really fast, both in terms of latency and storage on your system. The code command may be forced to pull down the entire source of a transitive dependency right now, even if it's not using it for the build, just to make a consistent decision about dependency versions during its resolution. So for the dependency resolution, this is what the Go command is fetching. This is how much of that source it actually needs right now. Remember that the only thing the Go command needs to understand dependencies of a module is a single go.mod file. So for a 20 megabyte module, it only needs a few kilobyte go.mod file to do this dependency resolution. So that's a lot of storage in your system's cache that's going unused. It's a lot of wasted time connecting to an origin server to pull down a large file like this when it doesn't need it right now. So for those of you who've been using modules for some time without a proxy, this is the reason behind some of that latency that you may have experienced. And this is where a module proxy can be really helpful. So going back to our example with the Go command fetching source code, let's put a module proxy into this picture. If you tell the Go command to use a proxy, then instead of interacting with an origin server, the Go command can interact with a proxy that has an API that's better suited for its needs. So let's walk through what this interaction with a proxy might look like. OK, so I'm working on my puppy's module. I've decided that I want to import a new package that tells me information about different dog breeds. So the first thing I'll do is I'll run go get go.dog slash breeds. So first the go command has to figure out which version of go dog breeds to fetch since I didn't give it one. So in hopes of finding the most recently tagged version, the go command is going to hit this list endpoint on the proxy. So in this example, that dollar sign go proxy is the proxy server that we've set up in our go environment. OK, so the proxy is going to give back a list of versions that look something like this with tagged versions like 0.1.0 and 0.3.0. And remember, the Go command is looking for the latest tagged version in this case. So that's version 0.3.2. So now the Go command knows the latest tag. And it's going to hit an info endpoint on the proxy for version 0.3.2 of Go dog breeds. This info endpoint is going to give back some extra metadata about that tag. 
So this metadata includes the canonical version for this tag or branch, which we're going to talk about a little bit later, as well as its commit timestamp. So it's going to use this canonical version given back by the proxy going forward. OK, so now it's time for the Go command to start understanding and resolving the dependencies of Go dog breeds at version 032. So it's going to start doing this by asking for its go.mod file. So the Go command is going to repeat the previous two steps of asking for the info and the mod files of each of the transitive dependencies, walking down the tree one dependency at a time. Now the dependency resolution is done. It has to actually go out and get the source code that you originally asked for. So finally, it's going to request that zip of Go dog breeds at version 032 from the proxy. The really interesting thing here is the ability to fetch information about a module's transitive dependencies from a proxy without requiring the entire zip of that source to do it. So the Go command is able to just ask for the pieces of information that it needs right now and not worry about the rest until later on. So at this point, there's one part of the flow that you might be wondering about. What's that info file doing, and why does the Go command need it? In this example, we're asking for the info at version 032. And it's saying, yeah, here's the info of 032. It's reserving, giving back the same canonical version that we asked for. Well, so let's see an example where that doesn't happen. Let's instead run go get go dog breeds at master. So this is telling the go command that we want to explicitly fetch what's currently at master. So we're going to skip hitting that list endpoint altogether. We're just going to immediately jump into requesting the info for the master branch right now. And it's going to give back that info. And it's a little bit different this time. This time, we got a pseudo version, which is a canonical version at master at the time of the request. And then things proceed as before. Once it gets that canonical version back, it's going to keep going. It's going to pull down and resolve the dependencies, and then finally request the zip file for the content at the end. So I've been speaking about a proxy in general terms, because there is no single proxy out there. Any server that implements the module proxy specification can be used by the Go command. And the specification is given by running go help go proxy. So you can see the spec here. It has the list endpoint for getting the versions, the info, the info endpoint for the JSON metadata. It's got the mod file for the dependency resolution. And then finally, the zip endpoint for the full source code. So I started this section off by saying that module mirrors were going to help us solve our problem of disappearing dependencies. But then I just started talking about proxies instead. Well, a mirror is just a special type of proxy that caches metadata and source code in its own storage system to reserve to clients. And these can be really helpful. It can help us solve our initial concern of disappearing dependencies from the source. So they cache source code in their own storage system, so the risk of developers pulling down their source code no longer applies to you. If it suddenly becomes unavailable at the source, maybe because the server is down or having issues, then you should have a module mirror that has a copy that you can salvage. You're also likely to see faster download speeds and less storage use on your system because the Go command is asking only for what it needs right now and not worrying about the rest. Unfortunately, it should be really easy to use a proxy. You shouldn't need to install anything to use it. You don't even have to have Git or Mercurial installed on your machine because the Go proxy is doing that for you. All your system needs to be able to do is make HTTP requests to it. OK, so now we have builds that are reproducible. And we have more confidence that our dependencies won't disappear. So two problems down, one to go. Next, let's talk about how we can trust that the source code that the Go command is fetching for you is the right one. So I said earlier that the checksum database is the solution to our security concerns. But before we jump into the checksum database, let's see how we can expect things to work without one. So without modules or proxies, back in the good old days, uh, the Go command would fetch source code directly from the origin server using HTTPS at head. You could be reasonably confident that this was giving you the contents that you wanted, but it was still possible that the origin server got hacked, for example, and that was undetectable by the Go command. And since your code was relying on the latest commit, it did nothing to protect you from a package owner suddenly changing their source code and breaking you. So with the introduction of modules, we also got something called a go sum file. So you've probably seen this before when you use modules, and maybe scratch your head wondering exactly what purpose is this serving and what, if anything, you are supposed to do with this file. So this go sum file is meant to act as your record of what source code looked like when you downloaded it the first time you saw it from your machine. 
So Go command can use this in some situations to detect misbehavior by origin servers or by proxies that might be giving you different code that you saw earlier. So here's that Go sum file I was talking about, which sits right next to your go.mod file in the root directory of your module. So it's basically a list of SHA-256 hashes of your dependencies and their go.mod files. So because this is a cryptographic hash, it's essentially impossible for you to change any of the files in a particular version without affecting the hash too. So you should never really have to touch this file. You shouldn't even really have to look at it. It's something generated by, updated by, and used by the go command. But understanding how it works can be helpful so you can understand its limits. So the go command can use these checksums for one very cool thing in particular. And that's for detecting whether or not the code that you are trying to download right now is different than it was when you, fir you first saw it, like a month ago or a year ago. Cisco sum file should also be checked into your repository because the go command can use this as a source of truth for other people going forward when anyone else tries to download your dependencies for your module. So once it's checked into your repository, the go command is going to check your module's go sum file when it's fetching code. So let's walk through a little example here. Let's say we cleared out our module cache. We need to refetch all of our module's dependencies all over again. So it's going to fetch the dependencies mod and zip files. It's going to make some hashes. And it might see that those hashes, those go sum lines, are different than it just saw in your actual go sum file that you had saved. So this might mean that the source code is modified. It might mean that a proxy or an origin server has been hacked and is giving you the wrong thing, or a myriad of problems. All we really know is that it's different than it was before, and we absolutely should not be trusting it. So all of this is a definite improvement from having no go sum file at all, but it does have its limits. The downside. It works entirely by trust on first use, and more specifically, your first use. So when you add a new dependency to your module that you've never seen before, including when you upgrade to a new version of a dependency that you're already using, the Go command is going to fetch the code, and it's going to create the Go sum lines on the fly. It doesn't have anything to check against, so it's just going to pop them into your Go sum file. The problem is, those Go sum lines are not being cross-checked against anyone else's Go sum lines. You're just accepting that whatever code you just downloaded is the right code, and your GoSum file will be your source of truth for that dependency going forward. So that might mean that your module's GoSum lines are very different than the GoSum lines for the same module versions that the Go command just generated for somebody else. Maybe because you requested them a week apart and the code changed, or maybe because someone was targeting you to give you malicious code. So it's not a perfect, complete solution here. To add a little extra risk for receiving the wrong code, you may have realized something really important when I started talking about proxies. Who's to say that a proxy is actually giving you the code that you asked for? What kind of confidence can you have that a proxy isn't intentionally targeting you to serve you something different than everyone else? If you didn't check in your go sum file, what happens if the proxy serves you something different when you ask for the same source code a month from now? All of a sudden, our relatively secure direct endpoint has been replaced by a proxy that has every ability to lie to you and isn't trustworthy on its own. So in the best possible scenario, we can imagine a world where the code author tells us what the Go sum lines should be, and we should just validate against that. But with Go code living in so many different sources, like GitHub or Bitbucket, you know, there is no single source to host code. And that's a great part of the Go ecosystem that we don't want to have to change to fix this problem. So what we can do instead is the next best thing. Let's make sure that everyone agrees to add the same Go sum lines to their module's Go sum file. We're going to do this by creating a global source of Go sum lines called a checksum database. So once the Go command gets its code from a proxy, it can then verify those contents against this global checksum database to make sure the hashes match. So you can imagine a simple way of doing this. We could just have a database running on a server somewhere that just gives you the Go sum file upon request. We can just tell the community, like, we'll behave and just trust us to always give you the right thing. But all that really does is take a problem and move it somewhere else. All we'd really be doing is creating a different target for attackers to focus on. You can also imagine a scenario where the checksum database is run by those cat people that I was worried about before. With a simple database, it would be easy for the checksum database to start targeting the dog people. They could serve checksums for the real code to all the cat people, and serve checksums for a malicious version of that code to the TOG people. 
Auditing the entire database is difficult and it's expensive. It's also really easy for man in the middle attacks to go undetected and manipulated data to go unnoticed by clients. So we shouldn't have to have a way, we shouldn't have to trust the checksum database as a source of truth without having any means of holding it accountable. So what we need is a solution that's not going to let the checksum database misbehave. It will make targeted attacks easily detectable to auditors and to the Go command. So we're going to do this by storing our Go Sun lines inside what's called a transparent log. It's a tree structure that's built by hashing node pairs together. So this is the same technique used by certificate transparency to protect HTTPS. You may have also heard it called a Merkle tree, if you're spending a little too much time with crypto folks like myself, <laughs> Filippo in the front. <laughs> so we use this Merkle tree instead of a simple database source of truth, because Merkle trees are just much more trustworthy. Its main advantage is that it's tamper-proof. So it has properties that don't allow for misbehavior to go undetected. So once you put a record in the log, it can never be modified or deleted. If a single record in the log is changed, then the hashes will no longer line up and will be immediately noticed. So if the go command can prove go sum lines is about to add to your module's go sum file or in this transparent log, then it can be very confident that these are the right go sum lines to add to your module's go sum file. Remember that our goal here is to make sure that everyone is getting the correct module version from a proxy or an origin server every time. And from our and the Go command's perspective, correct means the same as it was yesterday and the day before that and the day before that for every single person that asks for it. So it's important that we have a data structure that can't be tampered with. So this log provides a really reliable way of proving two key things. One, that a specific record exists in the log through something called an inclusion proof, and two, that the tree hasn't been tampered with, and specifically that a later tree contains an older tree that we already knew about, and that's called a consistency proof. The Go command is going to, is going to perform these proofs on the fly whenever it's adding any new Go sum lines to your module's Go sum file. We also hope that the community will run a few external auditors, since those auditors are crucial for the system to work. They should work together to watch and gossip about the state of the tree as it grows and alert on any kind of suspicious behavior that they might see. So I'm not going to go into all the cryptography in this presentation because that would take a long time, but let's just talk about a little bit to give you an idea of how it works. And hey, who doesn't love math? I know I do. So let's start with what this data structure actually is and how it's built. The foundation of our transparency log is these go sum lines indicated by green boxes at this image at the bottom. So let's start by assuming that our log currently has 16 records. So for example, record zero is the GoSun lines for Go Open Census IO at version 0.19.2. So these are the only GoSun lines for this module version that should be in the log. The only GoSun lines that the checksum database should ever serve. And this is something that auditors can hold us accountable to. So from here, let's start creating the rest of our tree. We'll do a SHA-256 hash of each record's GoSun lines and store them as level zero nodes. Then we can start hashing together pairs. We'll hash pairs of level zero nodes to create level one nodes, hash pairs of level one nodes to create level two nodes, and so on, and so on. Until finally, at the end, we have this level four tree head at the top of the tree. So why create these hashes to begin with? Well, remember those proofs I was talking about before? They basically boil down to comparing this top level tree head with those you've seen before or those you've just calculated. So let's go through an example of an inclusion proof, which requires only a few of these hashes to work. And proving that a set of Go sum lines are included in this tree is how the Go command will verify the source code that it just got back from a proxy. So let's say we want to verify the Go sum, li su go sum lines of Go dog breeds at version 032, which you just fetched from a proxy, which in this example just so happens to be record nine. The first thing we'll do is we'll hit an endpoint on the checksum database called lookup with our module version, and it'll give us back three things. The unique record number that identifies it in the log, in this case that's nine. The go sum lines, those hashes, for go dog breeds at version 032, and a tree head that's supposed to contain this record. To prove that record nine exists in the tree, we need to form a path from leaf to head and make sure it's consistent with the tree head that we were given. 
So in this example, walking up level by level, starting at zero, that's nodes nine, four, two, one, and then finally zero at head. So the Go command can create node nine at level zero by hashing the ghost on lines it was given. But it's going to need some more nodes in order to create the rest of the path to head. So here, in order to calculate the hash at node four, we need to hash together nodes eight and nine. Then we needed to, to use this newly created hash at four, hash it together with node five to create two, and so on, and so on, until finally we have that top level four hash that we've calculated ourselves. So if this top level four hash that we've just created at the top of the tree is consistent with the tree head that the checksum database gave us back from lookup, then we've done our inclusion proof. We verified that the ghost sum lines that we were looking for exist in the checksum database, and we're done. And as this tree grows, you're going to get new tree heads. And you should be checking that these new tree heads are a superset of the old one. And that's exactly what the Go command does. The Go command stores these tree heads on your machine as they're discovered, doing a consistency proof to verify that the new tree head it just found is consistent with old tree heads it's already verified to be sure that the tree hasn't been tampered with. And just one important detail is that proofs will still work even in an incomplete tree. So in this example, we have 13 nodes instead of 16. The only difference is that our path from leaf to head contains some temporary nodes that we just create on the fly. They're marked as X's in this diagram. And then we just throw them away when we're done. And that's really all there is to an inclusion proof. In practice, the last thing we need to figure out is how to get those inner nodes circled in blue from the checksum database in order to do our proofs. And these are provided through something called a tile. Not this kind of tile. This kind of tile. Under the hood, the checksum database breaks the tree apart into chunks called tiles. And each tile con contains a set of hash nodes that can be used for proofs, and they can be accessed by clients. So in this example, we've chosen a tile height of two, meaning a new tile is created every, level, every two levels up the tree. So as an example of how the Go command uses tiles, let's again look at our inclusion proof for record nine. We know that one of the nodes we'll need for this proof is node three at level two, like before. And this node is contained inside of tile one zero. So that's what the Go command will request from the checksum database when it's doing its proof. And tiles are really nice for the checksum database server since they're very cache friendly at the front end. But they also can save you some space on your machine because the Go command only stores the bottom row of each tile, building any necessary intermediary nodes on top of that. So the checksum database, in reality, uses a tile height of eight because it's much bigger than this. So instead of caching the entire tree, the Go command is just caching every eighth level of the tree on your machine. So now that you've seen some of the math, let's go back to how this works within the context of Go. This tree is made available to the Go command through what's called the checksum database spec, which is what you're seeing here. It uses the lookup endpoint and the tile endpoints to retrieve the data that we were just discussing. There's also an additional endpoint that's helpful for auditors, and that's latest. It just serves the latest tree head that the checksum database has created. And here's an example of such a tree head. It tells you the size of the tree and its hash value. So in this case, the size of the tree is 11,131. And we call these signed tree heads because there's a signature at the bottom, which contains the name of the checksum database, sum.golang.org, followed by its unique signature of that tree head. And the signature is important because it allows auditors to easily put the blame on sum.golang.org should it ever serve something that it shouldn't have served. So let's go back to our example with the proxy. The last thing we did was we fetched the zip of Go Dog Breeds at version 3.2. So before it updates your go sum and your go mod file, it needs to make a hash. It needs to check that it's the same hash that the checksum database has. So it's going to do a lookup of that module version. And the checksum database will give back its record number, the go sum lines, and a signed tree head, or STH, that contains it. So based on this record number and the records and tiles that it already has cached and verified on your machine, it can now just start hitting that tile endpoint to get the tiles that it needs for its proofs. And once the Go command is done with its proofs, it can update your module's Go sum file with the new Go sum lines, and we're done. So now, instead of every person in the world individually trusting their first download of a module version, 
the first version that the checksum database signs is the only one that will ever be trusted. So this ensures that the source code for a module, for a version of a module, will be the same for every single person in the world, since there's a single source of checksums that can be trusted and can be verified and audited. And this all works really well, even with just one checksum database that everyone uses. The community has the means of holding it accountable. And the go command does proofs on the fly as well, verifying that the checksum database hasn't been tampered with. This checksum database is what makes untrusted proxies possible. A proxy can't start intentionally, arbitrarily, or accidentally start giving you the wrong code without getting caught. If an origin server is hacked, then it's going to be immediately noticed. Even the author of a module can't change or move their tags around, altering the bits associated with a specific version from one day to the next. And what's really nice about this is that you, as a developer, don't have to do a single thing to make this work. You don't have to register your code anywhere in particular. You don't have to manage your own private keys or store your hashes in a secure source. This checksum database creates the one and only hash for that code and stores it in the log forever. So it's important to note that the checksum database doesn't just solve a problem that proxies have created. It's actually a much safer user experience than direct origin connections ever were since it better protects you from changing dependencies and from other types of attacks. So now we have the full picture. We have dependencies that are consistent, that won't disappear, and can be trusted by everyone. So fortunately, if these interest you, I have good news. Me and my colleagues on the Go team have built a module mirror and a checksum database that you can start using today. As of Go 113, the Go command downloads and authenticates modules using the Go module mirror and the Go checksum database that are run by Google by default. And under the hood, the Go command has a few environment variables that can be configured. Go 111 module, you can set to on to enable modules everywhere, or you can just leave it at auto. Or you can set Go proxy to a proxy of your choice to get picked up by the Go command when it's in module mode. So though this has been around since 111, the ability to provide a comma separated list is new for 113. And this just tells the Go command to try multiple sources before it gives up if the first proxy doesn't have what it's looking for. And the nature of the proxy in the checksum database is that the source code has to be available on the public internet so that it can be audited and used by everyone. So if you're using private modules, that's totally fine. You can just disable the proxy and the checksum database for the domains that you want to skip by listing them in the Go private environment variable. And a special shout out to the open source project that we use for our transparency log. We used Trillion for an implementation of the Merkle tree data structure that I was describing earlier. We relied on their data store to hold the Go send lines and the corresponding hashes that the Go command uses for its proofs. And you can check them out at github.com slash google slash Trillion. We've talked about the checksum database, we've talked about module mirror, but there is one more service that the Go team is providing in conjunction with these, and that's a module index. Index.golang.org is a simple feed of new modules that have been discovered by proxy.golang.org. And you can see this feed at index.golang.org slash index. You can optionally provide a since parameter if you only want to view modules newer than a specific timestamp. So modules can provide a better dependency management to developers by creating reproducible builds, ensuring that dependencies won't disappear overnight, and making sure that the source code that you are asking for is a source code that you and everyone else gets every single time. And I'm personally happy because now I have a set of solutions that can help me build out my model, which will make for happier puppies everywhere. We would love to hear your feedback, including how the mirror and the checksum database are working for you. We encourage you to file issues if you spot them. Thank you. Any question? That's a question. Hey, hey, are the leaves of the Merkle tree the individual Go files in the modules themselves, or is it just the go.sum files? The, each of the nodes are a set of go.sum lines. Okay. So it'll just be like the, the name and the hash, basically. So it's like the lines that'll go in your go.sum file. Gotcha. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's say that. Um, I am very sloppy, and I checked in a password of mine in my source code. Mm. And I don't want that to stay there for the public. So at one point, I rewrite my history in force push. Um, no one will be ever able to update my module anymore. They will all rely on the old version that is cached in the proxies. 
because from now on the hashes are not going to match. How do I advertise ah, that? I so the the log is immutable, so things will never like you can't change the module version once it's in the yeah. log. Yeah. Okay. So if, if you if something happened like you published a bad version, you just need to upgrade to a, a different version and tell people use that one. Like we're not going to remove it. Can't remove things from the, the log. Uh, the hashes themselves. So I would just bump the version, bump the and that would allow people to rely on it. Bump, but yeah, bump the version, tell them to use that. Well, that brings up another uh, problem: that his password will still be in the module proxy, right? Yeah. So that's something. Um, if you actually go to, so fact entry for this one, because <coughs> it's a very common question. Let's see if I can just show you. Um, I'll let you go do it yourself. If you go to proxy.goline.org, there's a fact entry about that. I don't remember exactly what we said, but I think it's just that you can like reach out to us. But um, the problem is that we don't know if someone's depending on that version, even if it's a bad one. So it's kind of dangerous to just pull things off because that r removes the promises that we want to make with the, with the module mirror. But um, yeah, check out the fact entry um, at the proxy.goline.org, and it's about that specifically. So how long does the proxy hold on to modules? It depends. Um, so we do special rules for like licensing and things like that, depending on how long we can cache something. There's also a fact entry for that one, too. So, so, so when you say that uh, I can depend on my dependencies not being gone, not go away, it only depends on how long the proxy holds on to those modules that I depend on. Well, so yeah, um, it's not necessarily like a, a, a promise or a guarantee that things will always be there, but it's supposed to help for sure. And you can always specify multiple, so like the go proxy environment variable in the go command for 113 is actually proxy.goling.org comma direct. So if for some reason the proxy doesn't have it or can't serve it, then it can try direct. You can also add like additional proxies in there as well. Um, but yeah, fortunately a lot of these questions are a answered better uh, in the documentation. Thanks for the questions. Uh, any chance that the source code for proxy golang org will be open sourced? Probably not, um, mostly because all the things, so a lot of it's already open source, so the um, the Go command and like what it's doing inside the checksum database to create the hashes and a lot of the crypto is already open sourced. Um, so all the only things that are closed source are just like the inner workings of the server and it's just like the Google infrastructure stuff. So it's not like anything interesting or that would be able to be open sourced. So yeah, probably not, more than it's already open sourced. Like the Go command is open source, for example, and we use the Go command inside the proxy to fetch things and create the hashes. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Thanks for your questions. Appreciate them. All right. Thanks, mm. everyone, so much for coming. No one? You're <laughs> no <afraid>. one else? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Katie. Okay.